Hello and welcome to Gold and Silver Assets. It's Sunday the 19th of April 2020. So some of our viewers have been asking about whether I think we're going to be getting into a situation similar to 2008, where we saw a large drop in the gold price, along with the drop in the stock market. And that got me thinking about quite a few things. And so today I'm going to present some of my thoughts here. So last week we looked at this chart, which is the gold futures premium over spot. And we noticed this large spike that seems to have persisted. And we noted that even if we looked as far back as 1976, such a large spike has never occurred before. Now, if we look at the same chart, but uh, going back to 2008 to 2009, now, if you remember, the gold price actually had dropped significantly from around March 2008. So that's around here and it bottomed out in around October 2008, so that's roughly here. And so over this time period, you can see that we've only had a couple of little spikes here, and they're kind of half the size of the spikes that we've seen recently. The other thing to note is that these are actually intra-week spikes, so they've got very long wicks and small bodies, whereas the current situation, we're getting some very long, solid bodies to these spikes here. And the, these um, futures premiums over spot are persisting at a high level, although they have cooled down a little bit recently. They remain above the kind of uh, average range that we've been seeing for many years. The next thing I want to talk about is the gold lease rate. So that's basically the cost of borrowing gold. And lease rates are derived from the London Interbank overnight rate or LIBOR minus the gold forward offered rate or GOFO. And we can see that back in 2008, there was a huge spike in the lease rate, it went to almost 3%, and that was associated with the drop in the gold price. However, in 2015, the LBMA actually stopped quoting the lease rates, and so that's why this is a flat line. Thankfully, the guys at Gold Charts R Us have continued to plot the implied lease rates, and from this chart, we can see that something very, very strange occurred on March the 27th. So that's that's down here. And basically what's happened is that the lease rates plunged. So this is the two month rate to as low as minus six percent. And these are record lows. I don't think this has ever occurred before. Now, just take a moment to think about this. What this basically means is that the owners of gold would have to pay someone to borrow their gold and they would be paying at a rate of 6%. Or in other words, if you wanted to borrow gold from someone, then they would pay you 6% to borrow it. This makes absolutely no sense and is certainly not something that's sustainable. And certainly if someone owned physical gold, that would actually be a deterrent for them uh, leasing out uh, gold at, at these very negative rates. So this is a very different situation to what we saw in 2008. One of the big drivers of gold prices is real interest rates. And the equation for real interest rates is basically the nominal interest rates. So, for example, the 10 year bond yield minus the rate of inflation. And so the Federal Reserve used the CPI for this. And, you know, some say that this is an underestimate um, and so it may even be higher. So in blue, we've got the real interest rates plotted and in red is the gold price. And what we can see in this chart is that when the real interest rates go up, the price of gold goes down. So basically, um, this means that they're negatively correlated. Now, if it was perfect negative correlation, then it would be a correlation of minus one. Um, I know that people have looked at this and calculated that this has got a correlation of 
around 0.8, which is pretty good. So if we look back in that 2008-2009 period, we can see that the price of gold went down and this was associated with a rise in real interest rates. So real interest rates went from 1% up to just above 3%, so it pretty much tripled there. So where are we right now? Well, we're in negative territory. Now, remember that it's not the actual number of the interest rate that matters as much as the direction that it goes in, in terms of how it affects the gold price. Um, just recently, we saw this big spike up and then it came back down and the opposite occurred with gold. So where do we go from here? Well, the way to think about that is to go back to this equation for real interest rate. So let's start with the nominal interest rate. If we think about it, we know that central banks all around the world are cutting rates and it's hard to imagine any of them actually increasing rates in the current environment. One of the big things, of course, if they were to increase interest rates, then that's going to put a strain on servicing various debts. So overall, I think it's pretty fair to say that interest rates are either going to go to zero or negative. So that leaves us with what's going to happen to the inflation rate. Now, we know that central banks' greatest fear is deflation, and they seem particularly keen on stimulating inflation. And so I suspect that if we do get a stock market crash and deflation, the central banks are likely to throw everything they have at it. So that would include things like buying stocks directly, more QE and helicopter money, which, you know, they've already uh, made a good start to that already. And so if there is deflation, I suspect it's going to be short lived and the overwhelming um, direction will be towards uh, inflation. And so as a result, if we consider both of those sides of the equations, that all points to a negative real rate of interest uh, going forwards. And if that is the case, that would imply a rise in the gold price. So really what this hinges on is how much and how long deflation uh, lasts. Uh, the next thing I thought I'd look at is the sale of gold bullion one ounce coins. So this chart is one that I made manually using data from the US Mint website. And this basically charts the number of ounces of gold eagles sold on a monthly basis. Now, looking back to around 2008, 2009, um, just remember this chart isn't quite perfectly lined up here, but basically um, the upshot is is that uh, drops in price were associated with spikes in sales. And if we look more recently, you can see that record sales occurred here. And this is when prices are actually relatively high. And so if prices do come down, then the demand is likely to increase even further. And I don't think the supply will be able to meet the demand for a number of reasons, including refinery closures and mine closures. So again, um, if we do see a drop in the paper price, I don't think that's going to be reflected in the physical price at all. Let's just have a closer look at what actually happened during the uh, stock market drops in terms of gold price. Back in 2008, from the peak to the trough, there was a 56% drop in the stock market. However, the peak to the trough in terms of gold was actually shorter and the total drop was 34%. But remember that the, these timings are quite mismatched as well. So um, the duration of the drop of the gold price was much shorter. Uh, duration and it recovered well before the stock market bottomed. So let's look at what's happening currently and from the peak to the trough in the current drop in the stock market, that was a 35% drop. 
However, gold from the peak to the trough, again, that was very short-lived and gold went down only 14%. And remember that it bounced back pretty rapidly and actually exceeded its peak, whereas the stock market has not done so, not even close. So let's look at the gold to silver ratio. This is on the monthly scale. Now, if you remember, quite a few weeks ago, I had drawn this upsloping channel here and we had talked about the gold to silver ratio breaking out above this channel and then probably coming straight back down like this. Um, I've just had a revisit of, of this and I, and I haven't moved the original channel lines that I'd drawn, but what I did do was clone this line and just move it up to fit the high that occurred in 2009. And interestingly, this actually matched the peak that we recently uh, saw in the gold and silver ratio um, about a month ago. That suggests that that is a significant resistance level. And given that we are already in, you know, thousands of years uh, of history at extremes in this ratio, I'm doubtful we're going to breach this upper channel line. And so that suggests that bearishness in gold is likely to be limited. So the ratio may have another go at that. Um, or it may just kind of consolidate here before going back into the lower part of the channel. If we look back in 2008-2009, the ratio, um, although had reached high levels, they weren't at record highs as we are now. So that's again something that's different and I think that does limit the bearishness that we can expect in gold. So moving on to gold in US dollars on the weekly scale, all of the things I've talked about so far make me think that the talk of sub $1,000 gold just seems very unlikely. Although I think we are likely to see further drops in the stock market, and they will probably hold back or even possibly drag gold price down, I'm doubtful that this will be to the extent that we saw back in 2008. If we were looking at drops that we saw in 2008, we'd be looking at prices going uh, from current levels down to, I think it, the, if, if we're looking at um, a 33% drop, we're looking at around 1,100 kind of levels. And that just, to me, seems um, a bit out there, considering all the other factors that we've spoken about. Part of the reason that price is being held back is all this price action that occurred between 2011 and 2013. What we can see is that we do have significant resistance here at 1800, so I would expect that to still cause some issues uh, going forwards. But having said that, we do have support at around the 1550 level here. And that has certainly um, built a support base over here as well. And that coincides with this upsloping channel line. So I think if we do get a drop, that is probably uh, where it's going to be limited to. And a worst case scenario would be a drop to our previous support levels here, which is around the 1450 level. And again, that coincides with this lower channel line. Now, after looking through a whole bunch of charts this week, I've noticed that we seem to have entered a world of ascending wedges. What do I mean by that? Well, when we're talking about the stock market, there's been a lot of rejoicing recently about how we may be in a V-shaped recovery and we're seeing green shoots, things are going to be wonderful. And if people just look at the daily percentage number changes in the stock market, then, you know, you'd hear people saying, oh, the stock market went up 2%, 3% today and any down days are pretty small. 
but I say that a picture paints a thousand words and you absolutely need to look at the charts rather than the numbers. So here I've got charts of the S&P 500 and I've also got the Australian index, that's the ASX All Ordinaries. And in both of these charts, what we see is ascending wedges. In the Australian chart, it's a much tighter, clearer pattern. And these wedges are also visible in um, quite a few other indices around the world. Interestingly, we also saw a similar pattern back in early March in the S&P 500, and you saw how that worked out. So usually ascending wedges are a continuation pattern of the preceding trend. So in all of these cases, the preceding trend was downwards. And so if we get a downwards breakout of this pattern, so that's below these lower lines, then that would be bearish and I would expect a strong move downwards. Now, there's a few ways that this can play out. There's no certainties. Very occasionally, these are reversal patterns, in which case an upward breakout can just keep going. But that's actually a low probability. More often, uh, what happens is that um, either it hits the top of this pattern, goes down and breaks down from there, uh, sometimes you can get a little pop out the top and then it breaks down. Um, once you do get a breakdown below this line, then sometimes you can go up to retest it before continuing the downwards move. But overall, the highest probability is a downwards move. And one of the difficulties with this is knowing the time scale over which this is going to happen. I'm guessing over the next couple of weeks, but uh, let's see. And in terms of targets, um, my feeling is that we're looking at a break down to test the previous lows and possibly even further. So let's move on to gold in US dollars on the daily scale. And again, we see a wedge. And I actually mentioned this last week. And what actually happened was that the price tried to pop out of the wedge, but then was pushed down. So it never actually closed above the top of the wedge. Um, had another go at retesting the top of that wedge. And then it finally broke down uh, below the wedge. So we're seeing the start of the breakdown. Now, there is a chance that uh, the price could go up to retest that $1,725 level. But after that, I would expect it to come back down again. And certainly if the stock market follows through with the down movements, I would expect gold to be uh, dragged down with it. I'm looking at targets of $1,575 or $1,500. $125. Now, remember that this doesn't mean that we're bearish on gold. This is just a short term move. And if price does bounce off $1,525, then remember that means that we're still making higher lows and remain in an uptrend. Moving on to silver in US dollars on the daily scale. And surprise, surprise, we've got another ascending wedge. This again has broken out to the downside, and so the targets I'd be looking for are either 14 US dollars and possibly even could go as low as $11.50. Now, again, I wouldn't be too worried about this because this could potentially be setting up for a double bottom. Remember this channel line that we drew weeks ago? Uh, as I said before, I'm doubtful that's going to be breached at this point. And so if we do get a bounce up, that's hopeful and we could get potentially get a nice bullish move upwards. Um, certainly, um, if price goes down to 11.50, bounces back up and breaches the $16 mark, we would be looking at a potential double bottom and that will propel it up to be on the 19 US dollar level. Now, there's been lots of excitement about the miners. So this is the GDX chart on the daily scale. And the reason for such excitement is that there was a massive drop and the recovery was equally massive. 
But again, remember, we're seeing another wedge here. And again, the price popped out of the top here. Now, remember that uh, we've got this very, very long standing overhead resistance that we've spoken about when we've looked at the GDX on the monthly or weekly scales. And price failed to close above that. All we've got is a wick. So that again shows us that, that is a strong resistance level. And it's only because of the presence of this wedge that I remain bearish on the miners. So we'd be looking for a drop below 29, and we're not far off of that at the moment. And that would lead to downside targets of 22 and 16. That would also mean that we close the gaps that we've seen uh, here and here. The only way that I would become bullish on the miners is if we get a close above 32. And so it would have to go above there and stay above there. And 32 would have to become a support level. I don't think we're quite ready for that. But that's just my uh, view. I could be completely wrong about that. So lots of interesting things going on in the world of gold. Um, lots of things to keep an eye on. So that's the end of the show for this week. Like and subscribe and we'll see you next week. Bye.